you very much for, for joining us for this session this afternoon. Uh, 15 months on, has anything changed in open banking for the industry, regulators, consumers? And uh, what's, what's been achieved so far and what's the journey we're on? So one of the key things that I do uh, as part of, of my job is to try and um, encourage the industry to go further and move faster. But one of the challenges we have often is uh, this if, so one of the things I say, if you build it, they will come. And that's actually taken from a film called The Field of Dreams, which seems quite apt today. So we have uh, with us regulators, industry participants, and open banking. And I'm really aware that the regulators um, have set out a vision. And that relies on the industry and intermediaries responding to that. Data is being made available to open up competition and innovation and choice. But it relies on some technology being developed. And so open banking uh, is building technology for fintechs and uh, incumbents. And they're assuming and hoping that the industry will adopt that technology. And meanwhile, the industry is building products and services, and they're rather hoping and, and assuming and expecting that consumers will adopt those services too. So, has anything changed? Are we living the dream, or are we in fact snoring gently through our reverie? And I have some esteemed colleagues with me here today to help me answer the question of what has changed. Um, Adam is our first panelist today. He's the executive director at the European Banking Authority, which is responsible for the European Payment Services Directive 2. Uh, he was previously chair of the Hungarian Financial Supervisory Authority and has had a number of roles in financial services. Imran is responsible for leading the open banking implementation entity and delivering the Competition and Market Authority's remedy to correct the failings of the personal and business current account, all on his own. <laughs> um, until recently, he was a partner at EY, where he's the head of global, or global head of fintech, and he's also a fintech founder in his own right. Emily uh, is a partner at Hogan Levels. She's worked for several years with fintechs and helping them navigate uh, the law and um, regulation of payments and consumer finance. She's increasingly working on projects which disrupt the traditional relationships between banks and their customers. Ed's here from BUD, which is an aggregation platform, financial management app, marketplace, all in one. And he's been collaborating with HSBC over the last year or two. Uh, and they're looking forward to um, implementing a first direct app later this year. HSBC are also one of the investors. And then Raman from HSBC, who's head of digital uh, for HSBC, and his team are responsible for driving innovation, uh, new digital ways of working, and the commercialization of digital platforms. And prior to HSBC, Raman was a vice president at House Trip, which is an online platform for holiday rentals. So, okay, I'm just gonna come straight out to questions. So Adam, perhaps you can explain to us what were your expectations and aspirations for PSD2? I think, uh, I think the expectations are, are really wide. Um, and, and to answer your first question, which was the, in the intro, um, has it delivered, has it happened, uh, has, it, has the dream come true, I would say it's early to judge uh, at this point. So to answer your, your question addressed to me, um, the short-term expectation of, of the implementation of PSD2 or the whole Open Bank Initiative, I think it's still a lot of pain. Uh, because we are in a, in a, in a phase of implementation, uh, a phase of providing clarity, both on the regulatory side as well as on the, on the industry side. The medium-term expectation I would have is, is much brighter, um, so I, I would be very, very positive on, on that one. We do expect um, a, a genuinely better quality of service for, for the consumers in, in the payments market across um, international borders. We do, expect, we do expect increased competition. That already is, is, is being seen and, and very visible. We do expect enhanced security uh, for, for the consumers in line with the, uh, with the new uh, reg regulatory requirements in, in, uh, generally in the security space. We do expect a wider choice um, for consumers to, uh, to satisfy their, their payments needs um, in, uh, in, in general. And, and we also, uh, I, I left it to, to last, but of course I, I'm a little bit biased being a regulator. We do expect that the regulatory landscape, what is regulated, who is regulated, and how it is regulated or they are regulated, is, 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 is going to be a lot clearer than before. And if I uh, can finish with the long-term expectation, I think the long-term expectation we have, and this is not in, in the next 
two to three years, but, but probably a bit beyond that, is that the European payments market will, be, um, w will become a market um, which is allowing uh, firms to scale up. It, it will allow um, market participants to, uh, to, to compete in new ways and new forms and to be uh, competitive on a global scale. And I think this is, this is very important uh, behind the, uh, the idea of, uh, of, of trying to do something at, at the European level. Okay, thank you. And um, Imran, how is open banking <coughs> helping to deliver PSD2 and, uh, and delivering some of these objectives and expectations? Great, okay, well I'll try and work into that question. I mean, for me, actually Chinese Premier Zhao in the 1970s summed it up beautifully when he was asked about the French Revolution, what his thoughts were on it, and he said it was too early to tell. And I put open banking in exactly that, that same category. Um, I, I, I would say that we are getting towards the end of the beginning. Um, and by that, I mean for 15 months, um, both myself and the central team, which numbers in the region of 150 odd people, and the nine banks that fall under the mandate of the CMA's order have been working very, very hard to get the underlying technology to work, uh, to get the underlying liability framework to work, um, and to make sure that as it does become live and consumers can use it, uh, their safety, their security is, is paramount. Um, and whilst PSD2 is fundamentally an important catalyst to making all this happen, um, it is not, for, from my perspective, uh, the end in and as of itself. Um, for me, you know, it really is important that we go back to the why, why we're doing open banking in the very first place. Um, and I think there are two primary reasons for that. Um, the first one is that actually, um, I think data and ownership control of data is actually a, co a consumer right. Um, and that isn't specific to financial services, albeit financial services has probably some of the most valuable data uh, that consumers own. And what open banking really is intended to do, and it builds on top of PSD2 in order to make this happen, is ensure that the consumers and SMEs can take back control over their data and use it to access better services um, and better propositions. And then the second point as well is that there are lots of pieces in the financial services industry here in the UK, a developed economy, that fundamentally don't work very well. And whilst open banking won't on its own solve all these problems, it is an enabling technology that allows many of these other innovators to come and work on, on top of it. And the kinds of things I'm talking about there are the um, several millions of people that can't get access to bank accounts, those that uh, have only got thin credit files, those that pay too much for overdrafts, don't get enough money uh, return on their savings. As many as 12 million people in this country are potentially on the wrong financial services product already. So all of that together is what the promise of open banking needs to deliver against. And guess what? That will not happen overnight. That is not a big bang thing. It's going to start from the CMA order. It's going to build on top of GDPR. It's going to build on top of PSD2. And over time, new companies, existing companies will build more of these propositions. And over time, those will then get in front of consumers. But it will take some time. Great. So, Emily, how are firms responding then? So, if we, what, 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 do, what are you seeing in the market? Um, we're, we're lucky to have um, a pretty good perspective, um, given that our practice uh, spans the tiniest startup to the to the biggest banks. So, we're seeing a fair amount of of, of what's going on. I mean, in in brief, I mean, if you look at the the numbers of um, third parties who've been authorised uh, since January last year. I think the FCA were absolutely determined to have some people authorised by um, 13th January 2018, and I think it was five, and I think Bud was one of them. So. Yes. Yeah. Um, now there are um, upwards of, um, or about 75, I think. So this is the sort of thing that's happening, but people aren't really seeing it. And, um, and what that says is that people are seeing the opportunity, they want to be part of it, and they are laying the foundations for um, uh, moving forward. Um, more specifically in terms of what, we, what we're say, seeing is um, a, a great deal of work trying to understand still uh, exactly what the regulations say, what they require, um, because you can't build your product until you're clear on that point. And, um, 
Uh, I don't think there would be anyone in this room or, frankly, anywhere that would um, claim that the regulations are as clear as everyone, everyone would like. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a great deal of, um, of analysis going on. And, and, you know, from the fintech side, it's um, why can't we have access to these accounts from the bank side is I'm sure we sh we're not allowed to give access to this type of account. And then more recently, there's been a big debate about what is a payment account, and that is, has also um, thrown into question the whole scope. And again, uh, you can't build your products until you know quite what the scope is. Um, in addition to that, of course, there's a huge amount of operational work that's um, involved. So I think this, you know, this is all still going back to the fact that, um, you know, from our perspective, people are still building foundations. Um, and you know, even when you've um, succeeded in getting the foundations right, and I, th I think, honestly, that this period since um, January last year and up to September this year, when the RTS comes into force, has been very much a sort of test and learn process, uh, building confidence in, in both systems and in the regulatory framework on, on both sides. Um, so, I, you know, I suppose that gives an idea of the things that are going on. The, um, in terms of what are people, what sort of products are we seeing um, being offered, um, we all know um, that the BARD HSBC um, collaboration is producing a sort of, I think, a, a form of service that is very much um, what was expected. Our smaller fintech clients are doing some uh, things that never crossed my mind that you could do with um, an open banking permission, um, looking at sort of B2B applications and um, how you can um, use uh, one authorised entity to provide open banking services to, to many uh, without the many needing to be authorised. So there's a lot of structural things going on as well. Great, thanks Emily. So um, Ed, if we've got all of this sort of foundation laying, we've got lots going on sort of under the radar, can we expect much for consumers? I hope so, yeah. Um, so if I talk to like what, what we're really interested in about open banking, so the sort of first thing about open banking is in our minds, it, it unlocks and it allows a, a better customer experience. And what we've seen throughout the sort of lifestyle of technology is that anything that results in a better customer experience is inevitable and will happen, right? So customers, if they can have something, either a company will serve it or in this case, regulation is, is pushing that forward. But we're seeing open banking happen in other places where it's not regulated. So we're seeing in the US, um, sort of proliferation of APIs from other financial services outside of core banking. We're seeing the same thing in the UK, but in the US it's very much led by competition and trying to access customers. So the question is, you know, what will we do in this world of open data uh, and, and what can we do with that? And I think that's the thing that we're really obsessed with because in our minds in, across Europe, in, in Asia, um, in the US, it's sort of inevitable. Um, so once you have access to that, that data, there's, there's so, much, so many different things you can do with it. We're seeing lots of new startups um, sort of look at, okay, actually we can build a specific piece of AI that, that analyzes spending in this way or does this with transactions. The truth is, transactional information is the deepest data set on any individual. So you've seen what like, social has been able to do off of like, a few likes and who you're friends with. Um, ultimately, this can be a, a force for massive good or a force for, you know, a lot of harm. So that's, I think, why it's important that in the UK we've, we've done it from a regulatory standpoint and, and built a layer there. But, you know, things that we think are really important and things that are happening is, you know, this rental recognition piece we're working on. So how do we actually use AI to detect uh, people's regular payments in a transaction history? We can say, hey, by the way, we've noticed you're paying rent. Would you like to set up a rental profile? Um, and then we're working with credit bureaus to build that as a as a credit profile and then checking that against landlords to make sure, yeah, this person is paying rent, verifying. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be able to do that if you just scraped the data. You know, you, that data could have come from anywhere. So because it's pulled from a bank, you can trust that that's that person. There's some consent matters and some mm -hmm. identification issues that we're still dealing with. But what it will mean inevitably is that actually more people will be able to afford to buy the houses that they're renting. And that's something that's super important and something that's very real and will, it will happen, I think, not in the medium term, but actually in the short term. 
So that's one of sort of 10 different things that we're working on similar. Mm -hmm. um, and you can imagine the impact that will have. That's great. So Raman, I guess the, the question is, if you, I think it's just struck by Ed's kind of thinking around this sort of proliferation of data. And part of this sort of journey is getting to grips with what the data allows. So if you've got any kind of experience at, at HSP to the, see the work you've been doing, what, how is it changing the cultural, the ways of working, or your, and the impact on your customers? What, what are you seeing? Right, so let me touch on, uh, I guess, the ways of working and, and the shifts within HSBC. So for us, open banking is acting as a catalyst, sometimes a forcing mechanism for a narrative that precedes open banking. And that narrative is very simple. It is about restating our relationship with our customers. And that restatement is about moving away from a focus on almost the bank silos and shipping those two products to focusing on true customer needs. It's also a shift uh, from having this very strong inward orientation to being open to partnerships. And actually open banking helps with all of that. So with that sort of umbrella, uh, we are doing three things very broadly. The first one is trying to create that new relationship uh, in something called Connected Money App, which is an attempt to do financial coaching, uh, real-time notifications, and open banking features are a part of that, but it's not the only thing. Uh, the real promise there is to take customers on a journey to financial capability versus talking about products and our products. The second one then is um, really testing around business models, uh, which are feasible on the back of open banking, and this is where working with Bud and our challenger brand, First Direct, we are experimenting uh, in the uh, innovation sandbox. Actually, we just concluded the experiment around uh, offering third-party services for uh, our customers, which for an incumbent bank is pretty radical. And we're learning a few things uh, there, including uh, some customer confusion around uh, how that is done. And uh, whether it is uh, successful or not comes down to how seamless it is within the experience, uh, the app experience. The third one is what I would call uh, really bread and butter testing for a bank. Uh, a great example of that is what Imran uh, touched on as well. How do you expand access to credit for thin file customers? So we've been doing a lot of testing using open, uh, open banking data to uh, offer credit to 3,000 customers who would have actually fallen out of our underwriting system had it not been uh, access to open banking data. Uh, I think that, so that is one example. And I guess a combination of all this uh, is, uh, is ultimately leading to a system which can be described as an ecosystem, which is a very fancy term for, a, for an idea where there are interconnected players uh, with the rules of the game being established, and ultimately, customers are in charge, and their consent is paramount front and center. And there are propositions where uh, incumbent banks play a key role, but also this ecosystem idea includes, in its very uh, definition, new sorts of players. Great, OK, so um, I just want to encourage you, thank you, Rowan, for that, um, to uh, do send in some questions um, on your apps. Uh, you can um, see the, if you go into the session, you can slide right, and you should be able to uh, send in some questions. So I've already um, had some, and I wanted to go straight out to, to questions. And Rowan, I'm going to come to you. It's a slightly different one. I, I could pose it to, to Imran, but I know the answer. So I'm going to just put it to you, which is, um, in terms of the evidence base, for um, measuring the impact of open banking on consumers. Are you looking at uh, that as, as a bank? Are you thinking about what is the impact of open banking on consumers for better or for worse? Is that something you take into account when you're designing and delivering new products? And are you, have you got any evidence so far of the impact it's having on, on consumers? You talked a little bit about being able to help some people access credit. So I think uh, the, the, the lens we are using is, is less about open banking. It's yeah. more about the, 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 the shift I explained. Mm -hmm. uh, and that we are measuring uh, through uh, engagement scores, really, with our customers. Uh, even going down to very social media sort of engagement metrics, how many people are logging on daily, divided by how many people log on monthly. So yeah. engagement scores. 
on open banking per se, I think we have stats around how many people choose to give consent and bring all their accounts in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the experience. And uh, I mean, those numbers are, they mimic what the market is like, about a third. And then uh, the credit uh, examples are actually very interesting where we know that the, the take up is much greater mm -hmm. and also the result is uh, 20, 30 percent improvement in lending outcomes mm -hmm. uh, because of open banking. And on the marketplace testing, uh, we have some evidence around what services work well. Without going into details, I think the principle is very simple. Third party services which are integrated very seamlessly and are almost invisible in the customer's ledger work better versus where they sit statically as a tile, for mm -hmm. instance. Yeah. Can I just ask you that, Adam? Are you doing any... So this is one of the, the challenges, I think, um, of regulation, actually, is that um, the potential is all there, and we see some interesting things coming downstream for consumers and for SMEs, but who, who's, who's sort of measuring the impact of that? Does anybody look at it in the round and say, actually, this initiative has been better for consumers? Is that something you'd be looking at? At, at this stage, we, uh, we, we do not have the resources to do that. So what we are trying to do is, we, 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 to do it ourselves, what we are trying to do is we are engaging with a lot of customer organizations um, regularly and in, 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 in a fashion that allows us to, uh, to have feedback from, uh, from them on perceptions, on risks identified, on, uh, on problem issues or issues of, uh, of, of clarity which will need to be provided. Uh, issues of communication, but we, we ourselves are not, not conducting uh, surveys or, or these, these types of um, exercises. Also, I would, I, I would stress that we are, we are in, in, in the process of implementing a, a lot of things, so it's, it, it would probably be a little bit too early if we're strictly speaking um, about, the, about PSD2. If it's in a wider context, of course, there are lots of changes which, which we are already seeing. Okay. So we have had uh, an obvious question, which I will put to, to Imran, and uh, it's just, have we got any data around how many uh, consumers are using TPPs, how many people are actually using open banking apps? So I have a plethora of KPIs, as you'd imagine, um, but I think it is important to just figure out how they layer up, um, and they start at the very essence with, one, have you created a standard, and does that work? And then number two is, have the banks implemented, and does that work? And then number three is, have we got TPPs that are authorized, and then are they able to connect to the banks? And then are they able to figure out propositions, then test those propositions, then get those propositions to the market? And then only finally, at the end of that very long gestation period, do you actually get real consumers actually engaging with it? And frankly, it's a little bit too early to really point to consumer uptake. Um, but the good news is, is that um, because of the approach that we've taken in the UK, um, where we do have this centralized authority that is responsible for implementing the standard, is that we do have a mechanism um, for getting some pretty decent insight on the market. Um, and whilst for the moment we are very public on number of calls on the API, we uh, give a lot of information on response times of the APIs, give information on the split between data versus payments, number of TPPs that are authorized, number of banks that are implementing it. Um, at the moment, I'm not prepared to, to divulge quite how many customers are using it. And there's two reasons for that. Um, one is that technically it's quite complicated. But then secondly, I want to be really confident that actually we have um, numbers that are very trustworthy that so for the UK as a whole we can really see what proportion of the population are using this. The good news is, is and, and I'm hoping that we're going to publish them in a matter of months, certainly over the course of, of this year, um, is that the numbers that we are seeing are material and they are growing and that is fantastic to see. What we then need to do um, at a point in the future and not too distant in the future is then do a qualitative assessment of um, products and propositions available through open banking and make sure that they are actually delivering the kinds of benefits that everyone here on the panel has, has discussed. So um, just a question for you, Emily, just building on something that um, Imran talked about earlier was around this um, idea. So consumers have control of their data and they opt in to share it with third parties. And, uh, and I just wonder, there's a question here about uh, whether that, so people controlling their data sounds a bit like it's shifting liability to consumers. 
can you give any sense of the um, of the intent around uh, consent, how it should work, and perhaps uh, what the liability framework looks like 15 months in? Are consumers better off, or or not as a result of this? Well, wow, that's quite a quite a big question. Um, I do think that you know one of the challenges um, facing this sort of subsector um, is 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 the trust question, and um, I also think a, a huge challenge is that those the question that you've answered requires knowledge of PSD2 and GDPR, which um, are both major bits of European legislation which have just been implemented. So there's, there's a, you know, plenty of, of scope for debate. I think one thing that doesn't, um, hasn't really come through yet enough um, is, is the answer to those questions from a consumer point of view. Um, the uh, consumers are very used to giving away their data anyway at the moment. I mean, there is, you know, there is a sort of qualitative difference, I suppose, in giving away your bank data to, um, to a third party. But at least in the, in the UK and the EU, that third party is authorised, um, which isn't the case in, in other um, parts of the globe. Um, I think that what consumers don't fully understand is, in a way, how well they are protected by the regulatory framework. So if, if their concern is about unauthorised transactions, then um, the protection is almost 100%, um, especially after the implementation of the um, code, uh, the contingent reimbursement model for uh, authorised push payment uh, fraud. Um, so I don't think that is very well understood, and it's not something that most of the people on this platform particularly want to explain, I don't think, um, because... Um, they do want consumers to act responsibly. Um, on the GDPR front, um, then you know, the whole principle of GDPR is that um, uh, consumers, individuals, should have um, control over their data. And you know, to a certain extent, extent, I think there is a bigger trust issue there, because once the data has left a bank and gone to a third party, um, you have to trust that third party to do with it what it says it's going to do. Um, and, uh, it, and, and then I guess it comes to a question of enforcement. But we, you know, we're already beginning to, to see more enforcement cases coming from the ICA, so maybe that will boost confidence. Mm -hmm. But uh, trust, I think, is, a, is quite a big issue. So we've got a, a good question here, which um, I'm actually going to put to Ed. Uh, which um, just, you know, based on this, this, this kind of plethora of data coming out, consumer trust and, and giving consent, do you envisage a time where banks may be asked to switch off um, channels in order to ensure that open banking is used in the way that it's been envisaged? So switching off access to certain bits of data potentially to, to enable... To customers or to, to, to third parties? To third parties so that we can ensure that data is used as it, as it should be used. Yeah, I mean, I think, again... I mean, it depends whether it's, this is under the framework or is under a sort of mm -hmm. opening up new channels. I think what's happening and what's happened inside the bank because of PSD2 is actually the bank has done a whole bunch of tech work mm -hmm. to actually expose um, parts of its services externally. Right? So right now it's, it's transactional data um, and payments. Um, but actually, because that tech work has been done, and this sort of goes further, than, I think, slightly than the question, then actually there is no reason why that work cannot be replicated across all the different services within, within the bank. And that very much changes the ecosystem that we exist in because actually any of your services from the bank can be consumed by a customer wh wherever they so choose in this future world. Um, and ultimately that, that sort of begs the question is like where will the customer choose to be in that world? Um, and that, I think, is one of the biggest questions that I, uh, certainly HSBC is trying to answer and most banks are trying to answer. In fact, most large technology companies are trying to answer uh, within Europe. We're seeing not only large American technology companies, Asian technologies enter the UK as well as large American banks enter the UK because this is the question that everyone has to figure out because, because open banking is happening here first. Every company has to figure out what part they play in that world of platform and, and customer experience. 
And so I think that that's ultimately is a burning question, is what, what experience, what services through this sort of customer journey yeah. that you can map out um, are valuable to customers? You know, how can third parties such as ourselves or other companies play in that? And how can large customer companies own, own platforms? Um, and ultimately that just comes down to how, how well you serve customer problems. Um, and so actually the, the question of will they turn off data, I actually think they will turn on more of their services to be exposed and, and consumed by the market because everyone is going to do it and everyone is doing it. So you're kind of dead if you don't. Um, Can I, I think, just, does that answer the question? Yeah, that's great. Can I just ask you a question, Adam, about whether or not you think that um, alternatives to open banking APIs will be turned off? So will screen scraping finally find its end or will that continue in the market? What's the long-term vision? Well, specifically on screen scraping, I, I, I expect it will, it will be turned off. Uh, so it, it, is, uh, it is not envisaged to continue um, on, on the, under the PSD2. Um, I, I think alternative channels, um, it's, it's difficult to say because it's, uh, it's, it's a very broad concept. Um, I, I think um, the industry is now moving towards the use of APIs. Yep. If you ask me about additional services other than payment services, I tend to agree that, that this will expand, but not necessarily the channels okay. uh, be, being turned off. Mm -hmm. So one last question. So um, I just wanted to, to, to put this one in because I think it, it builds on your, your point, Ed, about different companies entering this market and people trying to work out where they fit in. And, and uh, a question to Imran, I, I think, uh, with your background. So where do the big tech firms fit in here? So Amazon the like. Um, and with those firms utilizing behavioral data that goes beyond traditional credit worthiness, how will they fit in in a, in a post-open banking world? So last question, and I'll, I'll do a wrap up. Great, okay. Um, well, that's a killer question. The, um, I, at one level, I, I think we, we don't yet know um, because we don't, the big tech firms have not been particularly vocal as to what they intend to do in the open banking space. I can only really speak from my personal experience and what I see of the tech firms, um, given that we sit in the implementation entity and any entity that is frankly interested in coming into the ecosystem has to put their head above the parapet in, the, in, in, our, in our world, because only authorized entities can use open banking. Um, and I, to be honest, I, I see relatively limited um, interest from the traditional big tech firms uh, with regard to open banking. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One, we are in Europe. Um, and in Europe, I think the nature of the debate um, around customers' relationship with their data um, and precisely where particularly the big social media and search platforms sit um, means that actually uh, they're doing quite well um, out of the access that they have to consumers' data already. Um, and they're ambition uh, to get more data and specifically more sensitive data, financial services data, doesn't really appear to be there. So I think that's one very interesting thought um, that is worth taking away. Um, the other one is that these entities really are global. Um, and bar one, I think that they really struggle to look at each geography independently. Um, and the way that open banking is working, and it is working across multiple different geographies, is it does look very different. The UK really looks very different from many of the geographies in Europe. They may, and I hope that they will, converge over a period of time. But at this point, there is, they are very different. Um, and I can't see any you know, you know, big decisions being made in Mountain Dew or any of these other places where they, Mountain View, where they, where they will take a, um, a view to single and target the UK market. So I don't see it as being imminent at the moment. There is one exception to that. They're all very different. <laughs> <laughs> they deserve a discussion in their own right. There is one that's very different, but I think they're doing that to serve their core business model, not to get more information on customers. But um, um, we'll talk about it some other time. <laughs> Thank you very much. I just want to say thank you to the panel. It's been a really fascinating discussion. Just in terms of, I guess, some, some key messages to take away from, from this session. I guess there's high expectations, I think most of us in the room know that, around what open banking and PSD2 will deliver, not just, I guess, in, in the current account market, but how it moves through to, to open life, so the open finance generally and then to other sectors of open life. But we are in the early stages. It's clear that there's a lot of um, work being done uh, within the industry. It hasn't quite filled 
filtered out into uh, the consumer landscape as we, as we might have been looking for. Um, and so lots of foundations, different entities trying to find their place, trying to work out where do they fit, what's their role, where does the consumer want to have the relationship. And a lot of time spent getting, use, getting to grips with the data. What does the data allow? How do we use it? How can we get the right products and propositions uh, downstream? Uh, too early yet to, to give some numbers on consumers. I, I'm looking forward to seeing those come down line. But um, some interesting uh, challenges for the industry around, and also then for consumers, have, have we got enough trust in the ecosystem for consumers to, to consent to share their data? And is consent really working for consumers? And do consumers, uh, this is a question that's come up um, on here which you haven't had a chance to answer, but does does the consent model, does consumers having control of their data, is that actually really going to materialise? So thank you very much uh, for, for joining this panel discussion. I hope you found it interesting. And thanks very much to, to our speakers. Just give them a round of applause.